Hey, and welcome back to another podcast by me, Anna Mouse. So today, I want to talk about something a little more funny, I think, um, than, you know, sort of the subjects of my previous posts, anyway. Um, there was a sort of feed going on on one of the Facebook groups today about sort of the, the, the kind of ridiculous things that they've heard in their own sort of congregations or assemblies over the years. And we're not talking about necessarily uh, doctrinal uh, talks or stupid stuff like that. Um, but they were sort of talking about uh, other things, you know, like opinions of various elders, uh, silly comments people have made during talks and things like that, that everyone sort of believes in. Or it's, it's a view. And it goes back to what um, I've said before about the Jehovah's Witnesses having a culture. Not necessarily just rules and laws and a religion that operates sort of in its place. But it, it has become uh, a culture now. These ideas have bled out into something much bigger than merely just a rule and this is wrong and this is right. Because with Jehovah's Witnesses they tend to do this thing where they act like you have total freedom. And they'll say things like, we don't tell you what to do. We don't make you make a decision. That's up to you. Everyone has free will. Everyone has a Bible-trained conscience. Everyone answers to God, not to men. And yet, at the same time, they put themselves in the position of judges themselves. They do make rules. And it's very obvious as to what they consider right and wrong and what is the correct uh, way to conduct yourself and what isn't by the way they treat you once you make what they view as the wrong decision. For example, for many years they they viewed education, higher education anyway, like college, university, sort of extra courses, even extracurricular activities like drama class or whatever, after school stuff when you're a child. They view those things as wrong, as ambitious, as independent thinking, as worldly, as selfish, as anti-Christian, blah, blah, blah. And yet, when it comes to, uh, if, they, if someone were to ask them outright, do, Je- do Jehovah's Witnesses uh, disapprove of higher education or is it banned within the organisation, they would most likely, especially if they were talking to somebody uh, like in court or someone who's not a witness but is sort of challenging them or whatever, they'd probably answer very much the same in every congregation in the world as they've been taught to, which is always a vague and non-committal answer of, We don't discourage anyone from doing anything. No, higher education is not banned. A Jehovah's Witness can do whatever he or she likes. You know, we don't tell people how to live. And yet we all know that's a a bunch of baloney. We know that because with Jehovah's Witnesses, they do not let you uh, live freely. Jehovah's Witnesses, especially elders, are very uh, gossip-oriented. They're very, very interfering people. They'll come to your house and they judge you very quickly on what you wear, uh, what kind of decoration you have, what kind of movies you have on display, what kind of music you're listening to, what you're eating, you know, anything like that. I mean, I remember even before uh, the radio was on in my mother's kitchen, a Jehovah's Witness woman came round to visit. They were sort of idly chatting while the radio was sort of playing as background music. And as it does, as, as they will in this, this day and age, the, the nice song, which was by Coldplay or something, switched over to a bit of a raunchy song. I think it was um, Your Sex is on Fire, that song. And straight away the sister picked up on it and she sort of like acted outraged as if my mother was controlling what the radio was playing and ignoring the fact that the, the radio is kind of like a, a playlist of crappy modern songs on shuffle and nobody knows what's going to come up. But it's that sort of judgmental attitude, the interfering attitude that Jehovah's Witnesses possess and they feel that they have the right always to critique your life, to give you opinions and suggestions that were uncalled for, to tell you that you're bad, to tell you that you need to improve or change or dump somebody that you're seeing or whatever. So when it comes to the culture of Jehovah's Witnesses, obviously this attitude uh, applies to sort of everything and you know they start to interfere in your life and then they start to... Uh, develop these kind of absurd ideas about the world we live in because they're encouraged to do so and when that happens uh, some very very odd comments and attitudes are suddenly manifest and of course they vary from congregation to congregation especially if you're in one that is a little bit uneducated uh, which to be honest is more common than I actually previously thought 
uh, judging by comments from from people on Facebook, from people on YouTube, on my channel, and and just general comments from ex Jehovah's Witnesses that I know literally from all around the globe, because I know ex Jehovah's Witnesses from Wales, from New Zealand, from Australia, America, the UK, uh, Sweden, and other countries in this earth, and it's it's quite uh, interesting to see how unified. <laughs> Uh, the Brotherhood really is, but not in a good way, not in a way that they would actually like. Because not only are they unified when it comes to good things in their point of view, like uh, we all study the same watchtower every week, we all do the ministry in the same way, we all wear the same kind of clothes. It also is the same when it comes down to these bad attitudes, these bad habits, the gossip, the, the silly, silly beliefs held by Christians worldwide. So in this video, it would be kind of funny just to mention a few of them from my personal experience, from the experiences of others that I've read about on Facebook and other places. And uh, it'd be kind of cool if anyone with similar experiences uh, or, or has heard of sort of these silly ideas, point of views, um, could put them in the comments because it's always fun to read them. And it also highlights um, really the danger of being a Jehovah's Witness because I mean, some, some people who have left, I've said this before, some ex-Jehovah's Witnesses have sort of said, well, it's all in the past, you should just get over it and move on. Or some people say, oh, what's the big deal about being a Jehovah's Witness? And these are the ones who, who still are. Because, I mean, what's the big deal? You go to the meeting, you can pay lip service. I mean, what can you lose, really, from just pretending to be a Jehovah's Witness? And the reality is... Uh, <laughs> Their attitudes, their beliefs, their strange, strange notions about things are, are dangerous because they literally do change you and your mind and your belief and your, the way that you deal with things because you've been educated for so long in this culture. Uh, I mean, they really do put the cult in culture, the Jehovah's Witnesses, because even when we leave... Um, it's really hard to dig these ideas and, and ways of thinking out of our brains because it's been a part of our life for so long, maybe even forever, if we were born into it, sadly. So one of the ones I want to talk about, just, just quickly off the top of my head, I can remember that um, during a watchtower about the last days, I mean, it's quite funny because most of the, the articles, talks, watchtowers, books, are centered around the last days, about the urgency of the last days. Now, whether Armageddon is real or not, whether it's really going to come and destroy us or not, at this moment in my life, I can't even have an opinion on that anymore. Because I went from having a very, what I thought, clear in understanding of the way of the world, of prophecies, of the United Nations, of 1914, only to get them blown out of the water by various true and logical arguments that I've been reading, and now I'm a little bit uh, sort of adrift and lost, which is to be expected when you sort of, you know, come to out of the matrix. Uh, you have to sort of readjust and start to learn everything again. But whether or not it's true or not, the Jehovah's Witnesses are overly obsessed with the notion of the last days. And we know that because uh, when Charles Taze Russell started all this up, you know, like in the 1800s or whatever, he was overly obsessed with the notion of the last days. Armageddon, we don't have any time, and the end of the world has been falsely predicted by them many times. The most uh, infamous one was 1975, as we all know, which they categorically deny for some reason. Huh. I wonder what that could be. Um, but when it comes to this article anyway, it was talking about Armageddon, as usual, and everyone was sort of gleefully describing about how everyone would die and how we can't wait and how this horrible world is ruining their life. They can't wait to have their vineyard and their lion and their panda and to meet, you know, Michael Jackson when he comes back and all this nonsense. And this brother, they sort of said in the question, how do we know that the Armageddon is near? And where he pulled this from, I can only imagine, but an elder in the congregation who, bear in mind, is very well respected. Not only is he a very, very uh, long-serving elder, and he's getting on, in, a, in years, I mean, um, he's also the secretary for the congregation, and as far as I know, he's been that way my entire life, which is a decent amount of time. 
And prior to being uh, all of this within the truth, in fact, I'm sure he was still a witness when he was, in fact, the CEO of his own company or somebody's company. So it's not like he's an uneducated man. In fact, the way he talks in his answers, it used to annoy everybody, really, because he sort of came across as one of these who uh, sort of considered himself educated and superior in wisdom and sort of always overemphasized every word in the sentence of the scripture he was reading. And he used to really annoy everybody anyway. So when this particular person put up his hand and said the following comment, this, the, the look on my face, I wish I had a Kodak with me because it must have been priceless. And the sad thing was, because he was so influential, uh, everybody just nodded and noted it down as if what he said was, was actually legit. Now this is what he said, and brace yourselves. Uh, my corrugation was in the UK, by the way, just for, for reference sake. He said that um, as the birds of prey in England have been recorded to be rising in the last couple of years, so their numbers have gone up, we know that this heralds the beginning of Armageddon and basically says the, the end of the, the world is nigh because the scriptures say that, that we will need these birds of prey to eat the corpses of all the dead ones uh, slain by God. So therefore, a, a report of increase in, in the number of raptors, which is another word for birds of prey, like owls and vultures and falcons and hawks and those kind of birds, is conclusive proof that Armageddon is on the way. And what he basically implied was uh, that Jehovah was sort of making sure that there were enough birds to eat dead people after Armageddon. Now, not only is that completely ludicrous and not backed up by any scripture at all, or prophesied or anything, it, it shows to me the arrogance and ignorance of people like him who are sadly amongst uh, the smartest ones in the hall and amongst the most influential ones and the most powerful ones. Because his, his view that anything in the UK or in England specifically, it's, it's almost like it's, it's a benchmark for the rest of the world. So regardless of whether raptors are going down in France or America or African countries, well, who cares? Because in England, we've seen a 1% increase. Therefore, that means Armageddon is coming. It makes no sense. It's totally illogical. And it was just so egotistical and just ignorant, but willfully ignorant. It wasn't like he didn't know what he was saying was bullshit. It was just like he didn't even consider that, that it was almost like his, his entire universe revolved around his small town in a small country, in a small congregation, and he didn't even give a thought to any other country and their bird of prey numbers or whatever. Uh, and his entire comment was nonsense anyway. But I remember just thinking, wow, that was totally rubbish. And I kind of looked around the congregation expecting everybody to be sort of doing the same as me, kind of looking at each other and being like, what? And amazingly, and yet not really, because I should have known better really than to expect they would have any brains at all, uh, people were sort of nodding and going, oh yeah, that's a good point, and writing it down as if, oh, I must remember this point for next time I'm on the service and somebody denies that Armageddon is coming. I mean, who cares if next year uh, there's been a decrease in birds of prey, but well, it's not relevant anymore. We'll just stick with what this particular brother said three years ago. So that was one absurd thing that I heard and that everybody sort of agreed with and nobody sort of picked up that it was just, you know, rubbish. Uh, another one which was uh, vehemently sort of um, spewed upon me by my father was, I mean, that he said very stupid things. Uh, my dad was very, very sexist. He was sort of racist as well. Uh, he had very narrow-minded, uh, bigoted views upon the world. He hated homosexuals and all that stuff. Uh, and so, as is expected, he came out with quite a lot of zingers in his life. Um, I mean, you could write a book on the nonsense my dad has said, and it would cause outrage, you know, I mean, they, he would, it would anyway if people cared. But, I mean, amongst the daft things he said to me, which affected my life, obviously, was, for example, that yoga was demonic. Because I remember when I was at school, uh, as part of PE, which is physical education or, you know, sports, at school, uh, we were sort of given an options of what do we want to do, basketball, uh, hockey, blah, blah, blah. And then they said, oh, yoga as well. 
And out of all the sports, the one I hadn't tried yet and was quite interesting in having a go at was yoga. And so when I came home from school, uh, I sort of just double checked as I was trained to do with my parents with anything new and unusual. Uh, is yoga okay for me to do? And bear in mind, I was probably about 15 or something. So it wasn't like I was a, a small whelp wet behind the ears. I was, uh, you know, in, in my mid-teens and I still had to ask uh, for my parents' wisdom when it came to unusual things like yoga. Wow, so scary and strange. And my parents looked aghast that my teachers were teaching yoga as part of my physical education and sports course at school. Because my mother and my father both said, more, more my father than my mom really, but I remember him saying to me anyway, that as yoga is all about meditation, you're supposed to clear your mind. And that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Because if your mind is empty, it leaves room for the demons to come in and take over your brain and your thought. Why would we leave our mind open to such invasion? And then, of course, they quote nonsense scriptures about keeping your senses and staying awake and all this nonsense. And it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, what about going to sleep? Because by your logic, uh, when every night when I'm unconscious and my mind is free to wander and I have dreams of all sorts going through my head, uh, does that mean that the, the demons are going to come in the night then? and take over my brain because I'm not consciously, consciously uh, fighting against uh, demon, uh, demonic invasion. I mean, what is this nonsense? Uh, and then my dad started saying that yoga was a religion. I mean, yes, it's, it's tied in with stuff like Hinduism or something, I believe. And it, was sort, it sort of originates from India and from various religions. But the thing is, yoga is kind of like, uh, let me think. It's kind of like burning incense. Yes, incense is used in various religions. Yes, Chinese people of various religions use it and burn it in front of their their dad, uh, sorry, their, their dead uh, ancestors' graves and whatever. Yes, Catholic priests burn incense in, in churches. But if, if a young person bought a stick of incense and burned it in their bedroom just to disguise the smell of dirty socks and laundry, uh, could you say that that person, that kid, is actually being religious by burning a stick of incense? that they bought from the shop for 20 pence? Uh, well, no. Because just because something is, is sort of uh, part of some kind of big religious nonsense ceremony, it doesn't mean that the individual item itself or the practice of just stretching and breathing is demonic or uh, sort of anti-God or whatever. It's just nonsense. But anyway, I was taught that yoga is demonic. Uh, and so I missed out on that. And in fact, as a, as a young adult later on, um, I started to go to yoga classes sort of in secret at my local gym. And I, I remember I felt super bad about going and I thought, oh no, if, if, if my teacher tells me to clear my mind, I better not. I better think about something, anything, just so my mind won't get infected by demons. And it's ridiculous, isn't it? This nonsense. And yet, if you said to the governing body and accuse them of, oh, you guys say mad things like yoga's bad, they'd probably say, oh, no, we don't. But does Jehovah approve of yoga and its origins? That's probably what they say. Because Jehovah's Witnesses have this wonderful knack of denying that they actually do uh, abhor or forbid certain things. And yet they always end with a question of, what do you think Jehovah feels? Because it ignites guilt inside of you. You start to think, well... Would Jehovah like it if, if I watch this movie about wizards and witches like Harry Potter? Well, no, because Jehovah and Jesus wouldn't watch this film, so I wouldn't either. Uh, what about the, the ever so controversial and annoying topic of masturbation? Well, would Jesus masturbate? Oh, no, he wouldn't, therefore I shouldn't do it. And it, that kind of logic is, is just ridiculous. Would Jesus get married? No, he wouldn't. Oh, that must mean that Christians... Oh, wait, no, we can because God instituted marriage and the, the Bible says that when they forbid people to, to marry it's, it, it's from demons and all this nonsense so with Jehovah's Witnesses they always have this, this silly logic of uh, what would Jehovah think what does Jehovah feel about this would, what would Jesus do if he were here right now would he go and watch Star Wars because would he approve of the force and Jedis and violence no he wouldn't therefore you can't watch it but we don't tell you what to do we don't tell you what's good and bad. That's up to you. Free will. Free will. 
It reminds me of that uh, old 80s cartoon where uh, it's like a Star Trek parody where they go, we, we come in peace, shoot to kill, shoot to kill, shoot to kill. And it's like that with the Jehovah's Witnesses. We come in peace, shoot to kill, shoot to kill. You know, and that's what they're like. So that's two things anyway that they said which is nonsense. The bird of prey theory, uh, what? I mean, he's no David Attenborough. It's not like he's an expert in, in birds and, and the Bible and all this nonsense. He's just a jumped up little ex-CEO uh, with a big nose who thinks that he knows more than, than actual experts. So it's just nonsense. And the whole, oh, yoga is demonic and, you know, you'll be, like, possessed or something. You'll be like the exorcist. I mean, that's relaxation and stretching gone too far, really, if you ask me. Somebody's head spinning around. I mean, that's, that's like, next-level yoga. I mean, to be fair, you'd probably be famous or something after that. Because, you know, the top yogis would think, wow, this girl's been doing it for three days and she's already on head-spinning level. <laughs> But yeah, there, there were two things. Um, reading the ones on Facebook, which I've been having a look at, other people's experiences, some of them are not very nice at all, actually, and no laughing matters. Uh, for example, somebody said, and I've heard this as well, sadly, this isn't just uh, one person has heard this, that um, it's better for a woman to be killed than raped. Because rape is a sort of fornication and a sin against the body and makes you unclean. So if you're threatened with rape, sisters, uh, or they'll kill you, it's better to let them kill you rather than suffer the, the indignity or the, the, the uncleanness of being raped. And that ties in with that. Um, the whole uh, sort of bias against stupid things like self-defense, that was another thing my dad uh, banned me from doing. Because I said to my dad before, even as a teenager, I was very aware of the violence against women and females in this world. And I was concerned that if I did want to do things like walk outside or go on a train or get on a flight or go abroad, that I was uh, susceptible to attacks. It's a horrible part of this world and it's a horrible part of being female. And for all the men out there who say, oh, men get raped as well, that is true. And little boys, and it's terrible. But the thing is, there's a difference because when men leave their homes at night, uh, I don't think many of them look around their shoulder and think, oh God, I hope I'm not raped tonight. Or when they get into a taxi, they think, oh God, I hope that my taxi driver doesn't drive me to a, an alleyway and rape me. Because sadly with women, uh, it is a concern that they have and it's not an unfounded one. But when I was a teenager, I, I asked if I could go to self-defense classes, especially after watching movies where the female characters were doing self-defense, and I thought it was kind of cool as well. And my father said, Jehovah's Witnesses don't do self-defense and martial arts and boxing and all that kind of nonsense because it's violent. And the Bible says we should learn violence no more in the new system, that we should beat our, our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning shears. Therefore, Christians shouldn't learn how to punch and kick because that's like satanic. And I said, yeah, but... Hang on a sec, it's not like I'm asking to go out and to be like a, you know, a martial artist and like kick people's asses for no reason. I'm talking about if, if I get attacked or someone tries to hurt me or to, to mug me or, you know, worse or whatever, uh, if I can't defend myself, then I'm likely going to get hurt, killed, raped, robbed or whatever. So in the interest of my own personal safety, which is, should be my decision, you know, uh, am I allowed to go and learn self-defense? And yeah, it may involve martial art techniques. <gasps> oh no, trigger words. And of course, the answer was no way. And that got me very angry and afraid when I was a teenager. I remember even thinking as a teen, when I was probably around 13 or 14, that wow, this religion really does leave me open to being raped or attacked because it leaves me completely indef indefensible on purpose. That is, to me, the equivalent of getting totally untrained, skinny farm boys who've never seen a sword, uh, let alone held one, and saying, we're sending you all off to war. But uh, you won't die, will you? Make sure you don't die. And they'll be thinking, well, hang on a sec. We are going to die because we have absolutely no training or, or skills at all to, to defend ourselves. That all it takes is one big bloke with a sword to, to chop all of our heads off and we're all dead. And if I win, it will be a fluke. And that's the thing with, with women in society anyway, but especially within uh, 
chauvinistic religions like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they deliberately leave women susceptible to rape especially and other attacks because they tell women you should always listen to men. The head of the woman is the man. And that's a bit of a confusing scripture because when you challenge witnesses, they'll say things like, oh, uh, it, it just means husbands and wives. But the scripture doesn't say husbands and wives. It says men and women, which means in theory, as an unmarried woman, well, who's my head? My father? Well, what if I move out? What if I'm a grown-up? What if he's dead? Who's my head then? Does that mean I don't have one? I don't have someone in charge of me? Wow, that's freedom, but that's too good to be true, so that can't be right. So it's not very good. So that's one thing, and she, this person on Facebook also said that uh, she wanted to take self-defense lessons, but the elders said no, because Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to learn to kill somebody. Which is kind of funny, really, because they first assume that you want to kill somebody when it comes to self-defense, and also assume that you can kill somebody. Because let's face it, how many people, and this includes men, women, even people who are trained in self-defense, how many people really can be uh, attacked by surprise by being jumped on or something and fight them off and win? It doesn't happen very often, even with people who are experienced and capable. Uh, and that's why when it does happen that somebody who's trained in martial arts or whatever does happen to kick somebody's ass who's trying to attack them, it sort of becomes viral because it's like, wow, it actually worked. But regardless, people should still have the tools and the confidence especially uh, to, to defend themselves and not be restricted or forbidden just for some kind of religious uh, nonsense. Uh, someone also said that they were told that Pokemon was demonic. I've heard that as well. I've heard that Yu-Gi-Oh cards and all those kind of old playing cards are demonic. I heard that Harry Potter especially was demonic, no surprise there. Lord of the Rings, I was told, was demonic. Uh, I was also told that The Simpsons, and this was in a talk, I remember this vividly, from the platform, and at the time, even as a child again, I remember thinking, I thought we were told that we're not allowed to mention particular artists or movies or whatever from the platform, and yet this brother um, was talking about headship, that was the talk, one of those talks that make you, your teeth go on edge, because you know it's all going to be uh, bigoted, sexist nonsense, and he was saying that in this world today, men are sort of uh, treated with no respect, that women walk all over men. And I remember thinking, what? Okay. And he said, stuff like The Simpsons contributes to this uh, disrespectful attitude towards men and their authority over women. And he said things like, uh, in The Simpsons, Homer is portrayed as sort of a fat, lazy buffoon. He has silly ideas. His family laugh at him. His wife sort of berates him. His daughter sort of is smarter than him. His son plays tricks on him. And uh, he, he's a terrible sort of uh, role model for men. And he sort of promotes the idea that men, uh, especially the heads of the household, are silly, fat, lazy, bigots or idiots or whatever. And their families sort of pay no attention to his headship. They have no respect for him. So that was another thing that we were banned from watching The Simpsons. Uh, Another guy on Facebook said that uh, one elder said in his congregation that if you drink every day, you are an alcoholic. And so this guy was thinking, what do the people in Italy think about that? And I added, yeah, and Russia too, because in these kind of countries, uh, they drink wine or whatever, or vodka or whatever, every day. In fact, in Russia, I remember reading that vodka or whatever was considered a soft drink for kids. I mean, it may be, may be a bit extreme or inaccurate, but in these countries, drinking alcohol is pretty normal, and France as well. And yet, this again shows the ignorance of elders and witnesses in various countries who believe that every country is like them. That to, to say, like English or American standards, drinking alcohol every day would make you an alcoholic by their standards. And yet, if a person in Italy said that they drink wine every day with their meal, or people in Russia say they drink vodka every day with, you know, well, for no reason, I suppose, uh, that they wouldn't be considered an alcoholic. So it's back to that, that old uh, sort of narrow-minded view of the world again. Uh, let's see what some things that people are saying on here. Uh, oh, yeah, this is quite a crazy one. Someone says that in a 2014 convention in Cornwall, in, in the UK, 
There is a talk that mentioned that if a woman has to work instead of the man to support her family, and so her husband stays at home, she, the wife, would be to blame if her husband sexually abused his daughters and, I suppose, sons as well. And this is especially when the wife uh, has moved out of the country to support her family. Because I remember there were talks before discouraging people from, say, third world countries uh, from sort of leaving their kids with their parents and then moving to more affluent countries like the States or wherever to find work and send money home. And yeah, I mean, of course, it's making good points. I mean, parents should be with their kids and whatever. But this kind of talk is talking about, mentioned on this Facebook page, that if the wife, say, moves abroad and therefore, by the Jehovah's Witness standards, she puts money and career first and leaves her husband at home with the children and therefore he's denied sex and intimacy and those kind of things, that he will be driven against his will and have to feed his need of sex on, on his daughters and sexually abuse them. And then if the wife comes back, to find two broken children who are crying and can't live anymore. Uh, and her husband stands there like a, a guilty schoolboy and says, oh, while you were gone, I raised our daughters repeatedly. It's your fault that the wife should, what, cry and say, oh, I'm awfully sorry? I should have been here so you can, you can have sex with me. I mean, what is this attitude that the Jehovah's Witnesses have so, so hostile and so bigoted and so narrow-minded and openly sexist against women, especially when it comes to sex, is always the woman's fault if something goes wrong. If a woman is raped, it's her fault because, what, she shouldn't have been in the car with the brother on her own, she shouldn't have been at that worldly party, uh, she shouldn't have been asleep, she shouldn't have been a little drunk, she shouldn't have worn that skirt that was a you know, quarter inch up the knee. Uh, she shouldn't have left home and left her husband alone. And it's kind of silly because it, it also depicts men as kind of like lustful, uncontrolled idiots who, when they are left alone without sex, uh, that they're so immature and uh, sort of undisciplined that they just grab the nearest thing to them and start pumping away. And they're so silly that when they stop, they go, oh dear, I didn't know that what I was doing was wrong. I was driven to it by my evil and scheming bitch of a wife. And it's just disgusting, uh, this attitude they have uh, about men and women, and women obviously in particular, and children as well. Imagine saying to a child who was raped by a father, it's your mother's fault because she left home to work. I mean, what? Uh, and of course, yeah, again on this subject, people are saying, um, one particular woman said that when she was uh, a Jehovah's Witness, she was counseled in, you know, the little room, the dreaded room, um, for getting into a car after field service um, with a brother. And she was counseled because um, about the dangers of fornicating in the, in the car whilst driving. Now, for goodness sake, this is another one of those, they're so sensitive about anything sexually related. They are so overly paranoid and obsessed with the idea of sex. And of course, like, you know, in any other cult or organization or whatever, or other culture, it's usual when a, a culture is obsessed with something and they're very against it, or they say that they are, that they actually practice um, very, like, behaviors very much connected to what they're saying they detest. For example, um, in a lot of African in tribes, they are very, very superstitious and they, they are very paranoid about Satan and demons and devils and things. And yet most of their rituals, most of their sort of behaviours, their dances, the little toys they make, their religion, are all very, very demonic and sort of like Satan-oriented. The practice of voodoo, some of the dances they do, their beliefs about sex and fertility and childbirth, they're very, very much tied up with Satan and, and those kind of things. And it just kind of begs, beggars belief, really, that they're, they're so paranoid about satanic attacks, and yet they live a lifestyle that is very, very sort of attractive to that kind of thing. And it's very just, it's just strange. And again, people who are very, very anti-gay, especially men, oh, we don't like gays here. Oh, I don't want to do anything that makes me look gay. I don't want to wear a pink shirt in case people think I'm gay. And they're very hateful towards gay people. 
And then it, sooner or later, it emerges that the person who's been so vehemently against them all these years, maybe even hurt or killed homosexual people, is, guess what? Gay themselves. And it kind of is just like, wow, that thing again. People who hate things so much, it's, it's only because they actually want to do it. And it's the same with Jehovah's Witnesses and sex. They're so paranoid about sex. It's the biggest thing on the mind of any elder, really. That's what it feels like, anyway. Uh, and I remember I got counselled for that before. There was a much older brother in the congregation. He was married. He had three kids who were all older than me. His youngest daughter was two years older than me. He had absolutely no interest in me at all in that way, thank goodness. And me neither, obviously, I mean, for goodness sake. Uh, he was not at all attractive. He was a bit of an idiot, honestly. But because him and I worked on the ministry fairly regularly, because he was wanting to meet a pioneer, so he'd always be sort of dragging me out on the ministry, uh, I was counselled for getting into the car alone with him. And I said, how the heck am I supposed to pioneer and go on return visits and things with this brother, as I'm supposed to, without getting into the car? What do you suggest? that I tied uh, myself to the back of the car and put roller skates on? I mean, for goodness sake. And I asked one elder, what exactly do you imagine that this brother is going to do with one hand on the gear stick and the other on the steering wheel? And how exactly are, are him and I going to do things? And I also said, if he does something to me and I'm saying to you I don't want him to do anything, and he does, well, isn't that assault and rape? Therefore, that's not my fault. Their attitude is very strange. Someone else said that an elder said uh, from the platform that no one ever dies from refusing a blood transfusion. Now that is complete nonsense, that, that's a lie and that's outright propaganda. To convince people that saying no to blood transfusion is the best thing you can do, that it's actually going to save your life. Now here is the actual reality. Some people when they have a blood transfusion live. Some people, when they have a blood transfusion, die. Some people, when they have a blood transfusion, suffer uh, complications later on in life. That's true. And this is also true, that some people who do not have a blood transfusion, die. Some people who do not have a blood transfusion, live. And some people who do not have a blood transfusion, suffer medical complications later in life. They they both the same when it comes to the chance of living or dying, I mean, for goodness sake, it's a Russian roulette with any sort of major procedure anyway, but an elder who claims that no one who refuses a blood transfusion can possibly die is a full-on lie. Exactly the same if, is if someone said, oh, a anyone who has a, a blood transfusion will live, or someone who has an alternative will die, because this is the fact. We don't know. Some people don't have a blood transfusion and yet have an alternative and recover quicker than people who, who had a blood transfusion. On the other hand, they may also die, so we don't know. But that's just dangerous uh, advice to give, especially when you're in no way medically trained or a professional or anything like that. In fact, most of these people who, who preach about blood transfusions have never had one and probably think that they never will, so they can just freely talk about nonsense uh, and yet they have no sort of responsibility if a brother or sister followed their advice and then suffered bad consequences or even died they would just say oh well I never told them what to do free will free will uh, another common thing that they often say is that the worst person in the hall is still better than the best person in the world and they often talk about this when it comes to marriage and dating They'll say, now sisters, we know it's hard for you to find a partner in this world. I mean, they never really talk about brothers because they almost take it for granted that, oh, well, brothers will find somebody. They have the pick of the, pick of the lot. But women, well, again, they, they sort of miss out. And here they are whining about how single they are. And sisters, are just, they're just obsessed with sex anyway, so, you know, boo-hoo. And they say things like, now sisters, listen, we know that you're going to be tempted when you go to work, that handsome young accountant who is sitting opposite you, making eyes, but he just wants to use you. That's all they want from you. They don't care about you. Sisters at school, the nice, handsome lad in class, he may seem like a catch, but he's just bad news. He'll get you pregnant and give you diseases. 
And then they'll say things like, you know, just to cover our, our asses here, because I'm sure everyone knows someone like this, so you better say this quickly and kill this idea before it gets too strong. They'll say, now, sisters, we know that certain ones have been selfish and left Jehovah and shunned him to go out into the world and bag herself a nice worldly husband and they appear to be getting on quite well. Maybe they get married. Maybe they even come back into the truth and she brings her husband with her and therefore people may view it as a success story. Well, they're wrong. Because when it comes to a worldly husband, even if you're tempted, or, or a Jehovah's Witness husband, which one, and again here they pull out the Jehovah and the guilt card, which one do you think Jehovah would prefer you to marry? I mean, who cares about actual chemistry and good looks and actually having a nice personality and similar life goals? Because Jehovah's Witnesses only think about one thing when it comes to marriage. Uh, spiritual goals. Is your husband an elder? Is he reaching out? Is your wife-to-be uh, a pioneer? Does she do everything she can for the truth? Does she have a good reputation? Has she been married before? What's her reputation in her particular home congregation when it comes to dating, blah, blah, blah. And so they often say, to put people off, especially women, from going out into the world to find a partner, they say, oh, the worst person in the hall, sisters, is still better than the best person you could possibly find out there in the wilderness. So why would you even look at inferior men when there are plenty of good ones here for you to pick from? They, they often act as if you'll be downgrading, and yet they say, oh, we don't view anybody as inferior to us. Well, obviously they do, and that, that's a big attitude as well. So yeah, I've heard that one before, uh, about uh, the best people in the truth are better than the best, uh, the worst, or whatever. The people in the truth are better than the people in the world. And that's, that's very stupid, because that, that totally leaves people open to the dangers of people who are in the kingdom halls, who are violent, who are rapists, who are uh, abusive towards children, towards women, towards themselves, towards other people, who have short tempers, who have sexist, racist, or whatever is uh, attitudes, who are very old-fashioned, who are very selfish. Oh, who cares? As long as they go on the ministry four times a week, then that makes them a good catch. That's very dangerous indeed to put somebody in that position with someone who is potentially dangerous and say that they are still better than, than the, uh, that the very best person in the world. Now, I myself can say that's nonsense because I've dated various men who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses and I haven't really, I mean, okay, one was a terrible experience, but let's face it, there are horrible men in the truth as well. So it's not just, oh, it's, it's because he was a worldly guy. but. I've had plenty of nice relationships with perfectly nice so-called worldly guys as well who are kind, considerate, they don't pressure you for sex, they respect you, blah, blah, blah. And it's, and it's nice, you know. And you don't leave and think, oh, I'm dirty, I've been used. You just think, okay, it didn't work out, moving on. And currently I'm with a very nice guy who, wow, lo and behold, is not a Jehovah's Witness and yet treats me with respect, listens to what I have to say, uh, he's happy to be with me and doesn't push his beliefs or views on me yet he's curious about things that I believe and he's open to having open discussions and even would be interested in poking his nose in a kind of war once in a while just to see where I came from or what kind of life I've had and it's insane because the witnesses will try and say oh people in the world are no good for you they just want to use you or give you diseases or you know unwanted pregnancies but guess what it's not true it's just a lie, another lie. Uh, so that's quite a lot of mad things, really, that people have sort of experienced. Uh, everything from, I don't know, my my auntie had a record of, on vinyl, uh, Karma Chameleon or whatever it was called, and a brother and sister from the congregation borrowed it from her because it was quite popular at the time. They borrowed it from her, took it home, the family listened to it and then they went to bed and all of the family, including the children, all had demonic dreams. And therefore they returned the vinyl as quickly as possible telling her to destroy it because it was a channel for demons to come in. And I'm not joking, ever since that day, 
None of my family members will listen to that song, including my own dad, who's not even related to her. But I've heard other witnesses also say that. There's also weird ideas about the Smurfs. There's weird ideas about other songs, other artists, other films, artwork. I remember a sister said that wind chimes were demonic. Uh, even on my keyboard, there was a wind chime uh, sort of sound effect. And I wasn't allowed ever, ever, even by accident, to put that setting on because it attracted demons um stuff like that you know everything was about demons and sex weirdly enough that's what they are obsessed with uh let me see someone said here that uh one of the most stupid things i've ever heard possibly was a talk at a convention in the late 70s where i quote some idiot gave an entire talk on fornication against sex with the focal point being breaking down and analyzing the lyrics to rod stewart's song do you think i'm sexy Dear God. Someone else says that they heard that anal sex is gay sex, period. So, men and women in anal sex doesn't seem to exist. Uh, of course, I've heard that, you know, I mean, this is sort of doctrine or printed anyway, that oral sex, anal sex, or any other kind of interesting sex, um, other than just missionary, is immoral. It's funny how they can even make stuff that's allowed uh, forbidden. Interesting. Uh... Someone said here that an elder told her that her new husband, who was not a Jehovah's Witness, was going to make her participate in orgies, again, another sex thing. He would even explain, I quote, how everything would start as a party and then everyone would start feeling the place was hot and start removing their clothes. And she said, I gave him a dirty look and told my mother about it. My mom's comment at the time was, he's a crazy pervert. Yeah, again, another one who's obsessed with sex, by the sound of it, another elder. Uh, yeah, it's quite a lot of crazy things. So, as I've been talking for far too long, I want to hand it over to people uh, who are listening. Whether you are still a Jehovah's Witness, or you've left, or you've attended the meetings and decided this was too batshit crazy for you, you were out of there. Maybe you've studied, maybe you've read stuff online, and you're not sure whether it's actually real or not. I mean, there's plenty of rumours about Jehovah's Witnesses which are untrue and yet are kind of intriguing. Like, when I was at school, I remember kids used to say, is it true Jehovah's Witnesses can't drink tea or coffee? And I said no. And at the time, I thought, what, where are they getting this from? And then, funnily enough, I read an old article that said caffeine uh, is considered a drug and true Christians should really use a Bible-trained conscience about caffeine. And that if a Christian decides to abstain from caffeine products that he or she shouldn't be berated because it's actually sort of like a, a bible trained conscience thing that they would feel that they're abusing drugs by drinking coffee i kid you not so now i understand where they got this nonsense from it wasn't as crazy as i thought they also asked things like is it true jehovah's witnesses can't watch tv at the time i thought why would they think that now i understand why because of all the silly programs and laws and rules about you can't watch this show, you can't watch this commercial or whatever because it's too steamy or a cult or whatever. So yeah, anyone who's listening who has heard equally mad stories, who have heard people say the, the dumbest or weirdest or most, most outrageous nonsense and no one has seemed to blink an eye or think that what they're saying is odd at all, put it in the comments. I really want to hear um, because quite a lot of people have been commenting on my videos, which is great because one... It's open discussion, which is forbidden within Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's a relief, honestly it is, to finally start purging these thoughts that we've been holding for so long. Two, it's, it's interesting to talk about stuff and see other people's opinions and whether what we've experienced is sort of localised to our congregations or whether it is in fact kind of like a worldwide thing or a nationwide thing. And also, because it's damn funny, and it also means that you've been listening to my videos, which is great. Uh, so yeah, put them in the comments. Let, let's see what other people have been told and what we can come up with. And uh, peace out. Thank you for listening to my stuff and keep your ears and eyes open for the next one. Bye.